about a month ago, we did an event here at Fellowship that we've done for many years, and, and a bunch of you participated in it. It was called the Mini Family Amazing Race, and it's just this crazy, you know, um, like a smaller version of the Youth Amazing Race and the TV show, obviously, but it's a lot of fun. You show up as a, as a family, and you pay your $20, and it's planned out the whole afternoon, and you go from... Uh, task the task, and it's it's racing, and it's adrenaline, and it's everything all in one. I want to just for a second walk you through what goes through the Corbin family leading up to and during this race, okay? We take stuff like this dead serious. If you don't, you're out of the family, okay? So we decide what outfit we're going to wear first, and it's a shirt or something that we all have in common or whatever. Then we... we we're, we're, I'm going I'm to give a little trade secrets here, okay? Then, as we're, you know, a couple minutes before we're going to pull out of the house, we always make sure we throw in waters for everybody, a couple of towels because you don't know what to expect. Then we get in the car and we start driving, and immediately the family DJ, also known as Hannah Corbin, she pulls up on her phone some pump-up music for us. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Usually I don't agree with it because I'm an 80s rocker. But she puts on something like, what is that? And, and, and as we're driving to the church to register and see all the other teams, we start talking about it. And I've just got to be honest with you for a second. There's this sense of uh, excitement. There's laughter. There's, we're cracking each other up. We're uh, using our imagination, thinking about what could be, what are the tasks going to be. Um, we have total faith that the race is going to be planned and that nobody's going to die on the race. It's not going to be anything crazy. And there's this level of excitement. In fact, um, you know, we pull into the, the church. We crank our music up. We're having fun. Then we're registering. All the other teams are there, and we're talking with them. And, and you know, we're talking smack with them. I'm going up to people. I'm like, hey, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry you're going to be crying later because we're going to win. And, you know, it's just all this kind of stuff. And then, then the race finally starts, right? And you get the, the envelope, and you tear it open, and there's always strategy, right? There's always this sense of uh, using our imagination. What is this task going to be? Like this year, we pulled in, there's tables on the back back here in the yard. And trying to figure out what that is. We didn't know it was going to be eat Subway sandwiches, but we're inserting our own reality there, right? And then we're taking off, and the race, I think it had 13 tasks. Started at like 4.30, and we got back to the church at like 7, 7.30, whatever. And, and each task, you tear it open. I'll give another trade secret away. You tear it open, and when you look at it, you put it in your in your maps, like how to get there. You have someone else in your car, Google it. What is that? Then you start to think, I know my family's like, stop giving away the secrets, right? Because we win a lot because we're just, it's so much fun. Then once we figure out what it is, as we're driving, we're sitting there thinking about what task is going to be there. If it's a business, if it's a business, Home Depot, you know, whatever it is, when we're pulling in, I'm telling everybody in the car, look on the perimeters of the parking lot. Look for someone with a trunk up. Look for someone in a lawn chair because immediately we'll go to them if they're out on the outskirts. And there's this, this sense what's so neat about this race is that it starts to tap in to some childhood character traits that we all have. And many of us, as we get older, we push down. And what's funny is our, our kids love it regardless of what age they are. We have fun. We have shared memories. And we start to just use our imagination. You think about things. And sometimes, you know, when, when something comes up and you tear open the envelope or as you're doing the task, whether it be a, everybody has to go down the slide together, there's laughter. People are cracking up, laughing. I just bumped you. You fell down. And, and you're trying to do it fast. There's this imagination about what are we? what's the next task? What are we going to do? There's this sense of faith that these things are going to work. But then there's this excitement that starts to spill over. And before you know it, everybody's having fun. We're figuring out where people are on the race, how to do the next task, and everything in between. And by the time you're done, it's an adrenaline pump couple of hours. And you can just laugh and have fun whether you come in first or whether you come in last, it was so fun to just sit there and watch teams roll in and go through the slip and slide bowling pin thing and, and just watch it all. And then you start to talk to other teams, and they're sharing their funny stories, memories that they've made with their kids and all of that. And what's so neat, I go into this great description about it all, is the reason it's fun is because it taps into these childlike characteristics that we all push away. 
that we all push out of our lives. In fact, for many of us, what we think is to be mature, we have to put those things away. And I want to challenge you today that whether it be to be mature overall, and, but certainly to be spiritually mature, you don't put those childlike character traits away. In fact, you have to embrace them. In fact, I think that to really be spiritually mature, you have to tap into these childlike character traits of laughter, imagination, faith, and excitement to really be able to do all that God wants you to do and accomplish, to really experience the abundant life, the excitement, and the adventure that God's called you and me to in our faith walk. Today, as we open God's Word and as we look through the Scripture, my hope and my prayer is that you will go down your childhood memory lane just a little bit, remember some of these childlike character traits, and begin to think about where are they now? in whatever stage of life you found yourself in. As we continue worshiping, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the blessing of being in your house. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask now, Father, that as we read your word, that you would bless the reading of it, that, Lord, you would open our hearts to receive your word. And, Lord, we just pray that as as we wrestle with these thoughts of being spiritually mature and embracing childlike character traits, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts as only you can. Lord, tell us what you want us to do. Lord, help us to honestly reflect on our own lives. And Lord, in everything, we just want you to be honored and glorified. We love you, Father. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 10. And we're going to read verse 13 through 16 here. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Now, let's just stop here for a second. If you didn't know this, indignant is a bad word. It's a, it's a word of negativity. Jesus was frustrated with his apostles. So here you find Jesus. people are bringing their little children. So little children, just we grabbed our preschool children, some of our younger kids from the children's department. They're bringing them to Jesus to have them bless them. Now, if you just picture that scene for just a minute, everywhere Jesus went, huge entourages follow, and people everywhere. But now these people are, are being impacted by Jesus' life, his ministry, his teaching, his attitude, everything that he's done and said, so much so that they want their kids to see Jesus and they want to be blessed by him. Now, you've got to understand, in this culture, children were uh, to be seen and not heard. They weren't to be um, in, the fo- in the forefront at all. They were kind of to be off on the side. It was not a common thing for the children to be given center stage. But in this setting, the parents were so passionate, they bring their little children to Jesus. And you can just picture, if you let your mind use your imagination, these kids coming to Jesus, smiling, laughing, the parents excited, Jesus looking at them. Probably dropping down on a knee, sitting down, picking him up. Do you think he picked him up like all the pictures depict Jesus where he's like, do you think he's doing that or do you think he's smiling? Do you think he's hugging them? Do you think he's rubbing their hair? What do you think was going on? Because I'm going to tell you, whatever your imagination starts to go with, Jesus was loving on these kids. And he was blessing them. And the apostles are like, wait a minute, not mature. We need to get these kids out of here. This is adult type stuff. And the scripture says that Jesus was indignant. He didn't want the children to go. He didn't want the children to be pushed away. In fact, Jesus used this moment to teach a deep spiritual truth. Look what he says. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Let me read what Jesus said one more time. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He did two two different things that he was saying. Two truths that he jumped off from this moment. He said, see these little kids, don't hinder them. This was a very physical thing. Here's the kids, don't push them away. Let them come to me. Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Then he taught a deep truth, one that we need to embrace because we weren't there physically. He said, I tell you the truth, 
Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What on earth did Jesus mean by that? Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What he was saying in that moment was, you see all these little kids? There's some character traits about them that we each need to have to really receive and be, become part of the kingdom of God. There's some things that come so naturally to them that we need to hold on to. You see, Jesus was speaking primarily at that moment to adults. And as we get older, as, as, as we begin to move on in life at different stages, it's so easy for us to lose some of these childlike character traits. In fact, my wife and I say to each other at different times, you know, I'm, I get tired of adulting. You ever feel like that? You, ever, you know what, in fact, I really wish this was a true invention. Like real adult-sized strollers that you don't need it, but I would love to just get in a stroller and tell my kids, dude, push me around the mall and just, you know, give me a drink. Just put it to my mouth. Let me, you know, just take total care of me because I'm done with adulting right now, right? You know, there's a, there's a sense when you think about it, little kids, man, they've got the life, don't they? They really have the life. They're full of energy. They bounce all around. Have you ever thought how life kind of flips as you get older? Like when you're a little kid, what are some things you hate? You hate to take naps. Don't make me take a nap. If I grab any of you that are over 30 and say, I'm going to force you to take a nap, you're like, dude, what are you talking about forcing? I'm going to lay on the stage, right? <laughs> nap time's like, yes, you know, Sunday afternoon, yes, you know, that kind of thing, right? Things change and flip. There's something that happens as we get older that is a, is a, a real detriment if we're not careful. It's, now, now, hear me on this. I'm not saying for us to be carefree and irresponsible. What I am saying, though, is it, it makes total sense for us to slow things down a little bit and recognize that some of the childlike character traits are ones that we should absolutely hang on to as much as we can, all right? So as we continue today, let's take a look at this. How to be spiritually mature by being childlike because Jesus himself said, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you'll never enter into it. So how can we do this? How can we become spiritually mature by being more childlike? First, laughter. Laughter. Have you ever noticed children laugh a lot? Did you know that? In fact, if you start Googling this, there's all kinds of studies, and there's even some, some people out there that try to debunk the studies, like, this isn't real, this can't be right, how did you do that? And I just want to be honest with you, those are the people that don't laugh much, right? So laugh a lot. So here's some interesting things. Four years old, and, and regardless of what you, what you want to believe here, the, there's a lot of, of research on this that, that the point is true. That what, one of the things I read was four-year-old children laugh three to 400 times a day. Three to 400 times a day. Dude, that's a lot. That's a whole lot, right? But get this, the average 40-year-old male, 40-year-old male, four times a day. And I think that's a stretch sometimes. Like, as I look around, some of you don't laugh much, I don't think. Right? And, and whether you want to debunk the studies or what, because some people are like, what do you do? Just follow kids around. There's a laugh. There's a laugh. Or you walk, how, do you, how you get it? The truth remains. Kids laugh a whole lot more than adults. They just do. And adults, for whatever reason, the laughter has begun to diminish in our lives. We don't embrace it as much. But did you know that... Laughter has so many benefits in our life, so many, and these are off the chart. These studies have been scientifically done, and it's proven without a doubt. Did you know that when you laugh, your body releases endorphins, and it's flushed with these positive hormones that actually have a, a, a profound impact in your body? They make you feel good. They make you feel good. Do you know that a good, hard laugh, one of those belly laughs, you ever laugh so hard your, little, your abs are sore? Dude, I love that. I love that. I love when our family gets to talk and our man and I get to talk and we're just laughing so hard. And, and you, like, you start, when I start laughing really hard, I start sweating and I look really old and weird. It's like, oh, it's so funny, right? Um, do you know when you laugh that hard, it releases a lot of the same chemicals that you get after you work out? Did you know that? That are super good for you, super feel good for you and, and, and make such a big difference in your life. But they also get this. It flushes your body with um, anti-infection uh, uh, antibiotics, that's the word I'm looking for, to, to help you stay healthier. It improves 
blood flow and overall heart health. Overall heart health. I'm having some mic issues. Sorry about that. Overall heart health. In addition to that, get this. Emotionally and mentally, it makes you more optimistic. It makes you more positive about different things in your life. But also, in addition to that, it just helps your overall appearance. You look healthier. Did you know they did a study when people, when they were done laughing, they could walk in and people could pick them out of a crowd. They looked healthier. Think about all this. The benefits of just laughter. And yet for some reason, for so many of us, we've forgotten how to do that. Why is that? In fact, take a look at this. I, I really believe this. And, and you know, of course, um, we, we believe that Jesus is God's son. Absolutely. But I believe that Jesus was one of the greatest communicators of all time. He was the greatest. He used humor a lot more, I think, than we give him credit for. I think as he went on this three-and-a-half-year wandering camping journey with 12 guys, he called right out of their lives and stepped up on the stage and, and healed and fed and did miracles and all this stuff. I think in between what we read in the Scripture, there was a lot of laughter. We get small glimpses of that, very small ones. In fact, just a very small one is after Jesus is, is talking to the, the greater crowd about um, unclean and, and clean, this parable that he told them, his apostles didn't understand it. In Matthew 15, verse 15 and 16, Peter said, explain the parable to us. And Jesus says, are you still so dull? Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Now, you may miss that. You may miss that. Um, Jesus could have just answered, the par- answered him and said, here's what it means. He could have said, you know, why don't you get that? By him saying, are you still so dull, that was the equivalent of him ribbing a buddy. Saying, you knucklehead, why don't you get that? But we don't understand that because so many of us, as we've gotten more mature and we don't laugh as much, we want to project that onto Jesus that he didn't laugh so much because we start to think that laughter means something isn't important. Let me just be up front with you for a minute. I think a lot of things are critically important. I think one of the most important things that I do in my life every week is right here, right now, what I'm doing with you right now. And if you've never noticed this, I use a lot of humor. Why do I do that? Because I firmly believe that when people laugh just a little bit, they lower the walls around their heart, and then the truth of God's word can penetrate. When you laugh just a little bit, you feel more comfortable. You lower those walls around, and then the truth from God can come straight in. Now, that's a, 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 personal, a personal style, that's a personality, but, but, but don't ever think that just because there's laughter involved that something important is not happening. Don't ever do that, because I firmly believe that Jesus did that throughout his ministry. Laughter is very, very important. Second, how to be spiritually mature. Imagine, imagination. Children have crazy imaginations, right? Think about this for just a second. Einstein, you guys know Einstein, right? You guys get it, very smart guy, E equals MC squared. Listen to two quotes that he had to say about imagination. Imagination's the most powerful force in the universe. Most powerful force in the universe. And he went on to say it was more powerful than knowledge itself. It was more powerful than knowledge itself. Now, just for a second, I want you to track with me, just for a second. Everything that you enjoy in your life, everything. Everybody hold your phones out. We talked about them last week. Hold your phone. Look at these phones. Product of somebody's imagination. The car you drive, product of somebody's imagination. The plane you fly in to go to vacation, product of someone's imagination. Those Marvel superhero movies that are amazing with all those special effects, special effects are a product of somebody's imagination. Star Wars that comes out in December, same thing. All of this stuff, everything was a product of somebody's imagination where they begin to sit and think abstractly, think about what could be, what is, and how can this go together. All of these things are a product of somebody's imagination. In fact, on a different level, even how your house is decorated and the clothes you're wearing to church right now are a product of your imagination. You begin to look and say, oh, I think this looks good. I think this looks good. Now, let me just be honest with you. When it comes to picking out clothes, I hate that part. So that's why I have an awesome wife. And I'm like, hey, does this look good? Does this look all right? Because I can't do it very good. But some of you, you can imagine those things. You can picture those things. Picture those things going together. 
That's all part of it. You see, here's what I want you to understand. Imagination is part of how we were created in God's image. Because before God spoke and anything came into existence, he imagined it. He spoke and it started to come into existence. And he blessed us in so many amazing ways. So think about this for just a minute. Jesus made people use their imaginations when he taught them. And when you begin to read the Bible, when you get to, if you've got a red letter edition, which means those are the words of Jesus, look for how many times he makes you use your imagination as well. In fact, just, just very quickly, Matthew 7, 3. Matthew 7, 3. This is just a, a, a talk of, Jesus is talking to him about judging others. Listen to what he says here. Jesus said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, Jesus could have just taught, don't judge each other, don't do that. But instead, he gives this, this powerful image that forced the people of the day and you and I to use our imagination to formulate that picture. I mean, if you really put that picture in your mind, it's actually humorous too. Like you're trying to do, you know, get this little speck of sawdust. You got tweezers. Let me get that out of your eye. And you got like a telephone pole hanging out of yours. You're like, I got you. The people would have, would have chuckled a little bit in that moment. Third, how to be spiritually mature by being more childlike. Have faith. Have faith. Kids put absolute faith in those around them. They put absolute faith in those around them. And what's interesting is, as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about that, that especially when kids are young, they don't, they don't question anything. They're, they're totally expecting that their parents are going to take care of everything. They have total faith. They have total faith that they're going to be safe. They have total faith that, that um, they're going to be warm. They have total faith that, that they're going to be fed. They have total faith that when they get up in the morning, you're going to be there. They have total faith that if that changes in any way, shape, or form, if you're not going to be there, arrangements will be made, and they will know that in advance. Kids, when they're young, they don't, they don't go to bed at night thinking, man, I wonder if mom and dad are going to be there in the morning. And let me just say, in every case, that's not the case. And when that's not the case, that is tragic. But overall, that's how kids live their lives. But you know what's crazy? I was thinking about little kids. It's the same thing for kids as they get older. It's the exact same thing. My daughter, Paige, who graduated college, is 22 and lives at home, and she still has the same faith. She has the faith that when she gets up in the morning, you know, when she go, comes home, that she's living with us, that it's going to be warm. She's going to be fed. She's going to be taken care of. My daughter, Hannah, same thing. My son, Luke, sophomore at Alabama, he has faith that if he needs something, it's going to be taken care of. He has faith. He has faith. You see, we have to, to exercise this. We have to have faith. We have to know that God is going to take care of us. Even when it doesn't look like it, even when thing, things seem uncertain, we can take hold of this fact that God loves us more than we love ourselves. Just a quick side note, side thought on this. You know, we, we talked about Hurricane Harvey just a little bit. Um, Nathan talked about how many gallons of water. You know, even though it looks like those people, everything is lost, God is well aware of what they need and what they have and, and, and where they're going and what that looks like. And while things look tragic, God is still God, and, and they need to have faith. And the same thing for us. Like, we are not part of a huge nat natural disaster here in Mainville right now, but each one of us have experienced different disasters and different things that have come against us. You know, I was reminded of when our basement flooded. Because a gutter wasn't kicking the water out, it sent it right in, and literally our basement window looked like an aquarium. By the way, our house was for sale, and we had an offer on it. And it starts pouring in a finished basement. I'm just like, now, just to be honest, sometimes I freeze up. <laughs> like I saw it, I'm like, what? Ah! And Mary's like, come on, come on. I'm like, what? She's like, hey, come on, we got to get take care of it. Because I was about to just stand there for like an hour, like, what? You know? That kind of thing. But sometimes tragedy and disaster strikes us, even if we're not part of a natural disaster. Does that mean God doesn't love us because he flooded our basement on Nunner Road? No, not at all. That just happens. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. It's part of living in the world. We need to have faith. Look at Matthew 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus talking. He replied, because you have so little faith. What, what he was answering was the question. Some of the apostles, he sent them out, and they couldn't cast out some demons. And they came and said, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we do it? 
And Jesus responded back, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can. Say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will be done. Nothing will be impossible for you. We need to have faith. We absolutely need to have faith. Fourth and finally, how to be spiritually mature. Not only do we have to laugh, imagine, and have faith, we need to get excited. Children get excited very, very easily. Very easy. Have you ever noticed how, how easy it is to get kids excited? It's crazy. Vacation Bible school, it's always crazy when we, my wife and I usually teach the, uh, the kids uh, Bible story class. When they come in, we put on a little music, and when they come in, it's like, yeah, we're high-fiving them, whatever. And then they're doing that. Next thing you know, we're doing Simon Says or some other activity, and they're loving it. They're, they're laughing. They're using their imagination. They have faith. I'm not going to hurt them or throw them off the balcony. And even though I did tell a couple people we are going to do that on their birthday. Um, but, but we're doing all this stuff, and they're excited. They, they get excited. Do you know what we do as adults when we get excited? We hold it in. We play it cool. We don't want anyone to know we're excited. We don't walk into a room we're excited like, woo Right? We walk in, we're like, it's pretty nice. Right? Little kids, they walk in when they're excited. Woo! They're running around doing all this stuff. And I'm not saying we need to run around and do all kinds of crazy stuff. But what I'm saying is we need to tap into what that feels like just a little bit. It's okay to smile. It's okay to use your imagination. It's okay to have great faith. These things are good because they, they help us understand that we've got a heavenly father who's crazy about us. And let me just tell you something too. A little bit of excitement is contagious. It really is. Just like a little bit of negativity is. In a room this big, if, if I walked out, just let you guys sit here. Let's say we started the service 20 minutes late, deliberately. And we put cameras on you guys. That would be a funny study, wouldn't it? What happens? To watch you. What are we doing? We mic the chairs, hear what people say. What's going on? What's, you know, that kind of thing. I guarantee you this. Negativity would spread or excitement would spread. Or laughter would spread. Whatever it is. If, if some people, when they're, when they're waiting, just decide, you know what? I'm here to worship. And they stood up and just started singing. Even though nothing was going on on the stage, other people would start to sing. Other people would start to think, yeah, we, we're here. Let's do it. Who cares? Who, Nathan had a heart attack. He's back there. We're singing, though. We don't care. They would just keep on, right, because it's contagious. Have you ever thought about just how, how your actions can be contagious for your family, for your church, for your neighbors, and on and on and on? In fact, look with me at Matthew chapter 17, beginning verse 1. The Mount of Transfiguration, right? We all know this account. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with, with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, now let me just pause before I say this. Peter, James, and John are sitting here. Jesus takes them on the mountain. All of a sudden, Jesus is shining like the sun itself, and there's Moses and Elijah. And Jesus is talking with them. Peter's excited. James and John are excited. They're like, whoa, what's happening right now? And Peter can't control it. Like, Peter's just like, this is awesome. What's happening right now? So what's he do? The only thing he knows how to do, and Peter always spoke before he really thought a lot, but he's like, Lord, it is good for us to be here. And can you just picture Jesus shining like the sun going, Yes, Peter, it's good that you're here, right? Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, and and I just picture Peter, I don't know why for some reason I picture Peter going like, if you wish, you know, like so excited, like a little kid almost, if you wish, I will put up three shelters for, uh, three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, let's just get some perspective for a minute. He's been living with Jesus, walking, going at wherever Jesus went. Now Jesus looks like the sun. Moses and Elijah have been dead for a long time. They don't need a shelter. They just appeared. And Peter's just like, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I, I got to build something. You know, he just wants to do something. He wants to be involved. He's excited. Now, you know what's lost in this for so many of us? What on earth was, was uh, James and, and John doing? As Peter's doing that, what, can you just picture for a minute James and John are like, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. You know, just so excited to be a part of this, and I always wonder, too, what was, what was happening with Moses and Elijah? They're probably just sitting there looking at Jesus like, what? What's happening right now? It's such a tender but miraculous moment all at the same time that I think totally exhibits childlike characteristics that absolutely were contagious and go right along with everything else we've been talking about. 
And yet, for so many of us, we think that to be mature, we got to pack these things far away. we got to pack them away. Let me tell you something. When you begin to let these childlike character traits be displayed in your life on different levels, not out of, out of your, your own personality, not fabricating it, not making it up, but just a natural extension of who you are, letting that belly laugh out, use your imagination, getting excited, have faith instead of always thinking everything's falling apart. If you begin to do that, I promise you, it's contagious, and it'll begin to ripple out through the people you work with, your family, your friends, your community, your church, and people will start to look at you and say, man, what is going on with you? And at that point, you can just say, man, I just love being a child of God's. I love my relationship with Jesus. And that would come out of a sincere heart, not of anything that was fabricated. You see, Jesus said, as we kicked off today, unless you receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you're not going to receive it. I don't know what God's speaking to you about. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to have some deacons up here at the front. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, step out. Let today be your day of salvation. For the rest of us, let's stop being quite so stuffy. And let's start thinking about life from the perspective of children and begin to interact with God in that same way. We just might find this life we're living is pretty good. Let's pray together as our deacons come. Father God, thank you so much for the blessing that you've given us to be in your house, the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we ask right now that you would just speak to our hearts. Lord, we pray that during this invitation time, we would be obedient. Lord, we pray during this invitation time, we'd be childlike. You're our heavenly Father. Whatever you want us to do, we're going to do it. We have faith that you're going to do what's in our best interest. We have faith that by doing what you want us to do, it'll be the path to abundant life. Lord, we love you. We're crazy about you. We're excited to be in a relationship with you. And we ask you just to speak to our hearts now. Lord, I pray specifically for anybody in this room that doesn't know your son Jesus as Savior. Give them the courage to step out. Lord, for the rest of us, may we begin to live our life, to grow in our spiritual maturity by embracing some of these childlike character traits. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name.